Welcome to Financial Repression Authority's Roundtable Insight, where the best fund managers, economists, and industry leaders discuss the key investment issues and challenges in the current macroeconomic environment. Hi, welcome to FRA's Roundtable Insight. Today is Thursday, September 28th. This is host Richard Benulli. Today we have returning guest Charles Hughes Smith. Charles is author leading global finance blogger and America's philosopher, we call him. He's the author of several books on our economy and society, including A Radically Beneficial World, Automation, Technology, and Creating Jobs for All, Resistance, Revolution, Liberation, A Model for Positive Change, The Nearly Free University in the Emerging Economy, Pathfinding Our Destiny, Preventing the Final Fall of Our Democratic Republic, and Will You Be Richer or Poorer? And also recently, Global Crisis National Renewal, a grand strategy for the United States. His blog of twominds.com is one of CNBC's top alternative finance sites. Welcome, Charles. Thank you, Richard. Well, I'm looking forward to our topic today, um, the uh, the negative impacts of regulatory um, capture. Yeah, yeah, it's a very interesting topic and uh, this is part of our ongoing vision series of um you know suggested ideas concepts uh, particularly that come from your writing from your books uh your and also your blog posts and uh, you know some ideas uh first uh, talking about the problem the challenge and then we come up with some ideas and solutions and today uh we're thinking to do a discussion on regulatory capture so so yeah the, the idea of it being a net loss to society comes from uh, an economist by the name of george stigler he won the nobel prize in 1982 um he, he's best known for developing the economic theory of regulation also known as capture um which basically helps uh, interest groups other political participants uh, use the regulatory and course of powers of government to shape laws and regulations that is in a way which is beneficial to them, right? It, it's a regulation that benefits the incumbent. Um, and um, we've also uh, uh, looked at, and we'll post up a podcast by, by Bill Gurley. He's a venture capitalist with Benchmark did a great podcast that gave uh, a number of examples in this regard. Your initial thoughts, Charles? Yeah, I think that this is a very important topic, uh, Richard, because as, as as you and I were discussing uh, before we started recording, it, it impacts uh, society and the economy in, in very deep, profound, systemic ways that when money is essentially squandered, you know, working your way through a regulatory thicket, that is money that could have been invested in something productive, or it could have uh, been used to uh, boost consumer uh, demand, or it could have had many other uses. And so the fact that it was squandered uh, in a regulatory thicket, it, it, it detracts from society and, and, and also from the vitality of the, um, of the economy, right? Because that that money that could have been available for investment or or hiring people productively is then just uh, basically used to uh, support the incomes of of the regulators. And as David Graeber, the economist uh, famous for uh, debt, the first five thousand years, uh, that was one of his books that made an impact. He he wrote a book about BS work and. His point was that when you pile on layers of administration that that don't really have any productive value, then 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 that's BS work, and and the employees realize their work is meaningless, and it's not it's not a great situation for them, and it's a it's a net drag on the economy. So it it, it feeds through in so many ways when you're wasting money on unproductive stuff like regulatory capture. I just want to mention two quick examples. The revolving door is now well known, and in fact, you see it in the media accounts quite often. It, it means that someone that worked in a government regulatory agency uh, retires 
or quits and goes to work for the private sector that they were regulating at a salary that's four, eight, 10, 12, 20 times larger than their government salary, because now they have the expertise to go in and lobby the regulatory agency they recently worked for to the benefit of their new uh, private sector employer. And so we see a lot of this in the pharmaceutical industry. We see a lot of it in the defense industries where uh, the Pentagon official now works for a defense contractor and so on. So there's that example. And uh, the other one is the stories we hear from insiders in inside Congress, for example, where the, these lobbyists for private inter interests will actually write much of the bill that that so the statutes that are the new regulations. And so these bills that come into Congress that are 700 pages long and that kind of thing, much of it is written by lobbyists for the private interests who are benefiting from all this, uh, these hundreds of pages of regulations. And so that, that's those, those are two common examples of regulatory capture, how it actually worked, the mechanism. Yeah, absolutely. And that podcast by Bill Gurley, he, he gives uh, a couple of examples. Um, and I just like to relate that one is, with um, the uh, the COVID swab test that um, were, were used during the, during the COVID time, um, so there there was a, a a person that was working for Abbott uh, that that company, and um, he worked there several years. Then he became the leader within the FDA, the the group that approves that looks at uh, you know which which swab test can be approved and used in the United States. And of course he approved Abbott and, and another one, uh, I think two or three that, and basically he worked for two of those companies. Um, and what happened was the, uh, the cost of that uh, ended up being much, much higher. So, uh, and, and that's in contrast to in Germany where they had like 122 vendors, they want to RFI process on this. They narrowed it down to 96 and they offered the swab test and they got it down to like 75 cents per test. But in the U S this approach, you know, with the revolving doors, uh, was used and, and the cost came out to like $12 per, per test, you know, compared to 75 cents. Um, Biden authorized like $2 billion for, for usage on buying the swabs. He, and uh, Bill points out he would have done better if he went to Germany and just bought it from the stores directly, right, uh, for $0.75 cents in, instead of uh, the process that was used in, in the U.S. So that was one example of revolving door. The other one on um, the, the, uh, the process you mentioned, about uh, companies uh, writing the regulations, so so Bill Gurley gives this this example in the telco sector. Um, so what what happened there is uh, there was a technology that actually he was involved with with developing a broadband wireless, like where you basically bathe the the city, uh, you know, any any city in in wireless uh, Wi-Fi. Uh, so, so that uh, everybody could have internet that you know bridges the digital divide and and all that you know so the mayors loved it and um, the the problem is the minute they started to think about implementing this um, you had uh, I think he points out Comcast and Verizon stepping in you know so Verizon actually coming up writing the regulations um, verbiage and then just pushing it through in a way that prevented this from happening uh but by, by, by these small companies right these innovation companies um and uh, and i think they even went later to to implement the technology themselves um uh, so that's even even worse right uh but yeah so that, that, that that's what happened on that one um there's been some recent developments too even on bitcoin with the etf uh how BlackRock has been doing work and Coinbase has wanted, you know, to get into the business. They're having trouble. So I think the same thing is, is, is going on there. Um, your thoughts? 
True. Yeah, those are excellent examples. And I want to bring up another aspect of regulatory capture, which I call the regulatory thicket. And you can think of it as uh, a, a moat or a, a barrier around uh, a monopoly or around a cartel, uh, an existing cartel or monopoly. It's something similar to Verizon and Comcast, right? That's a cartel. And there's lots of cartels in the U.S. economy. There's only a handful of healthcare insurers, only a handful of hospital chains, only a handful of you know cable providers, and so on. And so um, the regulatory thicket is is not like uh, bills written specifically to eliminate competitors, which is, as you pointed out, one of your examples. That that's very common. But the, just creating a thicket that's so uh, complicated and complex that only major corporations can have the the funding you know the the capital and expertise to get through the regulatory thicket well that eliminates all your 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 less well-funded competitors right there you don't even need a new law it's just you, you've wiped them out because it's too it's too costly and uh, i just uh to give a couple of common uh life examples if uh if you're going to have a tax situation that's any more complex in the u.s than your wages and maybe a little bit of interest or capital gains, then you're going to face a lot of uh, complicated regulations in the tax law, which I believe is like 11,000 pages long or something, including all the regulations. So then you've got to have a, a tax attorney help you and uh, as an example, or if you're involved in some employment uh, contractual dispute, then you need an employment attorney and who's an expert in these, in these very complex thickets. So that, acts as a drag or an anchor on the economy as as you suggested that smaller firms more innovative ideas are frozen out of the economy simply by the cost of the regulatory thicket that they have to through in order to start doing business yeah yeah and it's it's very sad because you think of the great universities in the u.s or canada elsewhere where, where this is happening on regulatory capture that you've got all this intellectual capital that can create new technologies new innovation but especially in these sectors that you mentioned with was where there's a focus on regulatory capture it just prevents the whole cycle of economic activity and development and and uh becomes a net negative to society as economist george stigler has has pointed out um, so yeah, it's it's very sad. Whereas if you look at other parts of the world today, especially in areas of the global south, um, there's a much better regulatory environment that fosters or at least um, doesn't stand in the way of of um, innovation and economic activity. Your thoughts on that, Charles? Yes, Richard. That's a, we can talk about that further. That. There's a competitive advantage to having a rational regulatory system as opposed to the kind that we're talking about. In other words, there isn't a need for regulations. And I'll, I'll give you an example uh, that relating to like public safety, that uh, there were some very tragic fires early in the 20th century, for example, where there uh, the, the, were the result of insufficient exits in, in very crowded buildings uh, that were people were crammed into and, and there was insufficient fire equipment on the site and so on. So you want to have public safety and uh, transparency regulations. All this makes perfect sense. So you should have good government regulation that meeting minutes are made public, uh, for example, in terms of, of public uh, officials and uh, be, having to be transparent in, in when they're acting on the public's interest and you know fire safety public uh, in safety but those kinds of issues are very effective in with very simple regulations just just very simple things such as having fire extinguishers which have been inspected within the last year that are available to put a fire just simple things like that that, that are common sense but then when these things start getting piled on like layer after layer of additional regulation, all supposedly aimed at improving public safety and public interest, 
there's radically diminishing returns on those regulations. The, the cost goes through the roof, but the actual results, the actually the actual benefit to the public interest is actually rather modest, or it can even be negative, because if you create a regulatory thicket, people will just not do any of the regulatory requirements because they just feel like they can't afford the, the compliance. And so then you end up creating unsafe conditions because you've made um, compliance so onerous, no one can afford it. Yeah, those are great examples. Uh, I think it's also um, the whole concept of regulatory capture is fostered by uh, what we talked about in our last episode on the vision series that we're doing. Um, th and that was on governing systems and democracy. Uh, we, we talked about uh, director democracy versus representative democracy. And the whole concept of representative democracy, which we have today, you know, U.S., Canada, whereas in uh, Switzerland is more of a direct democracy type of setup. But in a in a representative democracy, it just lends itself to the potential for regulatory capture, um, and what we see that constantly, right, with with companies that provide uh, donations to potential representatives. Uh, to get elected to help them get elected uh with sort of an understanding that um, you know if you can keep keep us in mind for the for the loopholes and and uh the idea that we'll be able to help you write the regulations later when you know when necessary when, when needed um thank you very much you know so that's that's basically the uh the approach on that uh, what are your thoughts on that charles that's a that's an excellent point richard because as you say, that system is tailor-made for regulatory capture because the politicians need to raise millions of dollars to fund their next re-election campaign. And where are they going to get the money? They're going to get it from corporations with specific interests uh, related to regulations. And so you get these, you hear these um, kind of slogans or descriptions of that process, like the senator from Boeing. Not, not from the state of Washington, but the senator from Boeing. And, and yeah. so that I think that that's a very good point because it shows that the structure of our governance either lends itself to regulatory capture or makes it more difficult. And I, I'll add another point of how the system can be structured to lend itself tailor made for, for regulatory capture. If you have an agency that's supposedly pursuing uh, solutions to some public problem, say for instance homelessness or you know, food insecurity, that the people in that agency have every incentive to perversely keep the problem alive because if they solved the problem, then the agency's purpose would go away and they'd be fired or, or reassigned, right? And so the regulatory system that we have is set up to make sure the problem doesn't go away because the insiders only benefit if the problem is remains or even gets worse. Oh, you have this weird perverse feedback loop where the problem persists, but then we pour more money into it. And then private interests get involved getting government contracts to solve the problem. And then they, then they feed the, the revolving door and the politicians who manage to keep the problem going. And so, you see what I'm suggesting is we actually have with with the regulatory burdens and the, and and the representative democracy that creates a feedback where the problems never get solved but the money being poured in just keeps increasing and that of course makes it ever more lucrative to to do regulatory capture. Yeah, exactly. And and if you think about it, the the whole idea of of regulatory capture being a net negative to society. Um, along with what we've talked about in the past on uh, central banks, uh, money printing, QE, uh, how that benefits more on the financial sector versus Main Street. You can almost say these two factors, regulatory capture and central banking, bring uh, a bad name to, to capitalism, right? It, give it a, gives it a, a bad image, uh, especially to millennials, uh, because it's essentially contributing to wealth and income 
inequality, right? So the, if you think of the central banks, the other example we've talked about in the past that it benefits the financial sector, those that are closest to the money, because uh, like the simplest example is the financial sector can go to the window, the central bank window, borrow money at very low rates, and then turn around on the same day and buy a bond at a much higher rate and get that difference for free, essentially. You know, you and I can't do that, but these large financial institutions can. And so it benefits the financial sector directly uh, in, versus Main Street, right? So you have the widening wealth and income inequality. So yeah, central banking and regulatory capture, both providing a net negative uh, to society, giving capitalism a bad name and both contributing to wealth and income inequality. That's an excellent summary. Uh, very much so. And I would just add that just as wealth inequality hurts the middle class, the regulatory capture uh, puts constraints on small business because it's become so burdensome to open and operate a small business that the expenses of compliance with regulations is so costly that it's, it's difficult to even own or start a small business. And so then you end up with the kind of society we have where there's a corporate outlet on every corner and small business has been gutted. So the, you're right. The social costs are huge, um, almost incalculable. So, uh, but as, as, as you say, with the vision series, we, uh, we always try to end on, on, on potential solutions. And so we were just, uh, you mentioned the idea that other nations have a better, more rational a less costly regulatory structure for starting businesses. Yeah. A any ideas on that, Charles? Like how, how can that be done? Um, have you, have you written about this in, in your blog posts and, and books in terms of potential solutions in this regard? I think the, 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 the idea that I've promoted seems almost too simple to work, but it's called radical simplification where, there's a political goal that that people support in such a way that, that the political powers that be cannot ignore that that social demand for for a better system. And one example is is like a one stop permit desk. In other words, where if your business needs a permit in, in the regulatory thicket we have now, it might take three months, six months or even years to get a permit. Those of us in the industry being being regulated, uh, for instance, building and planning, we know that you could issue a permit in 48 hours because most of the almost so much of the construction and, and planning and so on is, is well within norms that are well understood. So there's really no need to have a six month long, horribly costly process. So simplifying, say, hundreds of pages of regulations down to a few dozen. It's entirely possible. It's entirely possible if there was a political will. So I, I would sort of uh, suggest that that radical simplification is one is one uh, one approach to dissolving the regulatory thicket. But you have to have a political movement that that holds the powers that be feet to the fire. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that simplification and maybe that could also be part of a regulatory review process or, or a regulatory review program, maybe the best way to describe it. Uh, um, and, and this could be fostered with direct democracy versus uh, representative democracy, as we talked about in our last vision series ep episode. Um, so the, the idea here is regulatory review program, essentially what you're saying taken to a further level. So, you know, maybe we have the the Ernst and Youngs, the KPMGs, the Deloittes, right? Look at um, at doing uh, a review of all the regulations, uh, eliminating duplicates or close to duplicates, uh, refining du uh, regulations that uh, don't quite make sense or are are outdated, um, and uh, making other regulations more more efficient especially for a business activity and of course uh looking at the regulations that have to do or have embedded uh, regulatory capture 
verbiage within them, right? Uh, benefiting the incumbent companies in, in that sector. So uh, addressing all of that. So maybe some type of regulatory review program could help. Y your thoughts on that, Charles, for a solution? Yeah, Richard, I think that's an excellent point, coupled, as you say, with direct democracy. I, For example, I could easily imagine a direct democracy initiative that was uh, imposed a sunset law, for example, on all regulation after three years or something like that. In other words, every regulation would be uh, observed or, or looked at to see if it could be eliminated. S something like that, where the public demanded and, and had a legal ability to demand that these regula regulatory thickets be thinned out. And so you're right, that, that would make a big plus in terms of having a political initiative that had to be obeyed. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's great. Great points, Charles. And uh, your, your final thoughts and how could our listeners uh, learn more about your work uh, and your, your blog posts and your writings and your books? Yeah, thank you, Richard. I, my, I guess my final point would be that there are differences locally within states and counties and countries that between the which ones make it easier to open and start a business and which ones make it nearly impossible. So if there's certainly something in arbitrage regulatory capture that you can make decisions and choices about where to live or where to start your company. And, and the differences in the between the choices in terms of the regulatory burdens that you face, it could make a big difference to you, the success of your business. So that that's uh, something that's that's well worth researching. And then, yeah, please visit me at uptominds.com. Uh, you can uh, sign up for my free Substack uh, distribution. Uh, you can get free samples of my books, and all my archives are free. Awesome. Thank you so much, Charles, for the discussion and insights. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Richard. The FRA Roundtable Insight Show is for informational and educational purposes only and should not be considered as a solicitation or offer to purchase or sell any securities. The investments, investment strategies, and investment philosophies discussed or presented on the show each involve their own unique risk factors which are not discussed on the show. Any discussions among the panel participants or responses to listener inquiries are based on the personal opinions of the panel participants and do not take into consideration the listener's suitability, objectives, or risk tolerance. Please be advised that you invest or speculate at your own risk.